I want to start with what most of you have been talking about today. Do you know what was trending in India today? Let me read out the top 10 trends. Irfan Khan, Rest in Peace, R.I.P. Irfan, Angrezi Medium, Legend, Pan Singh Tomar, Gone Too Soon, Om Shanti, Lunchbox, R.I.P. Irfan Sir and Makbul. All of them are related to one man, Irfan Khan. He was 53 years old. He died today. The tributes continue to flow. What I'm going to say next is politically incorrect, but I'll say it nonetheless. Irfan Khan was one of India's finest actors. He was also a Muslim. The tributes he received today have nothing to do with his faith. They have nothing to do with Irfan Khan's name, his religion or his beliefs. Because India never saw him through the lens of religion. For Indians, for his fans the world over, he was an Indian actor. India doesn't have to prove its secular credentials. But for those who keep asking, here is the latest proof. A country of more than 1.3 billion people united in mourning the loss of one man, Irfan Khan. Why am I telling you this? Because a report was published last evening. In fact, our team alerted us about it more than an hour before we began the show yesterday. We chose to ignore it because who cares about what some panel in America has to say? A smear campaign deserves no attention, especially not during a pandemic. But the report was quoted repeatedly. A lot of noise was made, so much so that the Indian Ministry of External Affairs had to issue a statement. So tonight, we've decided to call out those who sit in judgment of others with no locus standi. I'm talking about the USCIRF report on religious freedom in India for 2020. The United States Commission on International Religious Freedom. They think that secularism in India is under siege that it's drowning. India has been categorized as a tier two country. It has been downgraded to the lowest rank possible. That is the rank of a country of quote unquote, particular concern. Do you know which other countries have been placed along with India? North Korea, the world's most secretive state, a prison masquerading as a country. China, a country with re-education camps for minorities, a country which attacks all faiths. Iran, a nation which controls every aspect of its society, and Pakistan, a country which has left its minorities to die during this pandemic. India's equivalence to these regimes is outrageous. But for the USCIRF, the steepest and most alarming deterioration, their words, the steepest and most alarming deterioration in religious conditions was in the largest thriving democracy of the world, India. What makes them think so? Let me decode something that forms the very basis of this report. I'm quoting here. In 2019, the national government used its strengthened parliamentary majority to institute national level policies violating religious freedom across India, especially for Muslims. Policies violating religious freedom. Which policies? They have mentioned the Citizenship Amendment Bill. India says, the bill only recognizes the dire straits of minorities in India's neighboring states. It makes a special provision for their rehabilitation. How does it violate religious freedom in India? The USCIRF fails to answer that question. The Indian Ministry of External Affairs, meanwhile, has responded to these baseless charges. It has said that the panel's biased and tendentious comments against India are not new. But on this occasion, its misrepresentation has reached new levels. It certainly has. Let me tell you how. Do you know who controls this body? The USCIRF. It is on the payrolls of the US federal government. It is run by nine members. They're called USCIRF commissioners. Out of the nine, six are said to be associated with Christian missionary activities in the US. Can quote unquote missionary activists be trusted to be impartial on the matters of religion? I don't think so. The other three may be three men who do not really agree with the body's official stance. The first one is Commissioner Gary L. Bauer, who said, and I'm quoting, I must dissent from the decision of my fellow commissioners of placing India in a gallery of rogue nations in which it does not belong. Number two, Commissioner Tenzin Dorji. He says, and I'm quoting again, India does not belong to the same category as authoritarian regimes like China and North Korea. The CAA has been challenged 
by the opposition and the civil society and that the press freely reported on both anti and pro CAA voices. It certainly did. We can vouch for that. And lastly, Commissioner Johnny Moore, who said that India is a nation that is the very definition of diverse. India's freewheeling democracy will give way to an even brighter future through those challenges. Yes, there are challenges. Yes, there are protests. And yes, there is media scrutiny. What does all of this signify? That India is a functional democracy. So why does this American panel think it can sit in judgment? Who has appointed them the international moral police? Again, not politically correct, but I'll say it. It's our fault. I'm reminded of something that I read recently. Listen to this. Biology determines psychology, it says. Every race and community has a collective personality. What is ours? We are still shackled by a colonial mindset, by the urge to seek validation from the West. So India invites European MPs to give them a certificate of normalcy in Kashmir. India celebrates every word of praise in the Western press. And India feels hurt when they sit in judgment. It's time to stop seeking validation from the West. Now let me show you the minority report that America will not talk about. And we've been saying this for weeks now. The United States of America must get its own house in order before it gets particularly concerned about India. The USCIRF report is soaked in hypocrisy. I have some reports for this body which reveal how the situation in America is particularly concerning. Stories that American panels won't tell you. The first one is by the Washington Post. It talks about how African Americans are dying at higher rates due to the coronavirus. Why? Because they have been left at the mercy of America's healthcare system, which has long been shaped by racism. There's disparity in the way they are being treated in comparison to their fellow Americans. They're working jobs that don't pay them if they do not physically show up. There's an assumption that African Americans are immune to the flu and have been left to fend for themselves. They're being forced to work to keep the business going. The result is this. Most mass transit workers who are sick by the hundreds in New York are African Americans. When they show up at hospitals with signs of infection, they have to deal with biased white doctors, doctors who do not even refer them for testing. Listen to this. I say this to America when it's talking about marginalized community, there is no such thing as a margin. We're all running away, right, from everything. And every time we run, we push and prattle and drop and stomp on other people. And this is just a perfect example. The test kits are a, a hot commodity, right? But there's everyone needs them. Everyone needs access. And as we start talking about health care, let's get past this coronavirus and really have a united conversation about what does it mean to be a, a, a country that's taking care of their own in the most basic way, which is health care. It's not an issue about the haves versus the have not. It's basic health care. It is basic health care. Guess what? U.S. health care officials themselves are dealing with racism. Ethnic discrimination is being experienced by a large proportion of non-white surgical residents. Medical school graduates who are being discriminated against in surgical training. The Northwestern University in Chicago conducted a survey. The findings were published only yesterday. They're worth looking at. 23.7% of the respondents complained of discrimination based on race and religion. The rates were the highest among African Americans at 70.7%. Asians, 45.9%. Hispanic, 25.3%. The discriminatory behavior included biased evaluation of their work, being mistaken for another person of the same race, and hurtful comments from patients and their families. Is this not particularly concerning? Doesn't this violate the USCIRF standards on identity-based discrimination? Would the USCIRF dare to put its own country on such watch lists? If the answer is no, then this body's campaign for international religious freedom is bogus. It has no rights whatsoever to give lessons in secularism to anybody, certainly not to India.